Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, we've just wrapped up our legislative priorities breakfast. Um, we had some moments afterwards, uh, and um, I am here. I mean, we do it all whole, whole blank on this. I am here today with uh, Leonard Bernard from the Greater Philadelphia Bicycle Coalition. And um, he was one of our presenters, and some of the points that he pointed out that it's been 47 years that 47 the years. coalition has been advocating for safe roads mm -hmm. and connections. Uh, not only are they doing talking about the bicycle, but they're also having conversations about the pedestrians mm -hmm. that are sharing that same footprint. And also transit. The, the idea being that they're a virtuous triumvirate. If you improve one, you improve the other two by default. Uh, which is very different from car infrastructure. When you add car capacity, you kind of make things worse in the end for everyone. When you improve transit, when you improve biking, or when you improve the pedestrian experience, you're improving the experience for everyone else. So we, um, at, right afterwards, I had some time and we spoke to, to Molly and, and the work that he's doing at Lyme. And one of the things that, that we constantly beat the drum at TMAC for is, is the evaluation that we make for the curb space. You know, really, when we're charging cars a dollar an hour to park at the curb you know we're, we're undervaluing that that space absolutely as well as what we do to the sidewalk when we're you know pushing and shoving the design work around with that um you know tmac takes approach um as we do with clean energy um, we are we are fuel neutral you know we know that there are times that there are places for gas mm -hmm. and diesel. But then we also need to look at the infrastructure for CNG oh. and for electric. And it's really thinking about the whole system. And I think um, with our conversations, you know, and, and a little bit more explanation from you is looking looking at the sidewalk and curb space as a whole system for transportation. Mm -hmm. you know, from the Bicycle Coalition's perspective is, you know, what is the optimal conditions for, for a cyclist to be within a community? You mean in terms of the road infrastructure? The road infrastructure. So I think the optimal condition is a trail. And, a, a, you know, in a, in a utopian society, everyone has a trail in their backyard that connects to another uh, larger trail that connects them to wherever they need to go with no interactions with auto traffic at all. That's the, the gold standard. And some people in our region are lucky enough to have that from their apartment or from their suburban housing development, their cul-de-sac, they can get right to a trail. Uh, the CVT is a classic example of that. Uh, most people are not that lucky uh, and most people cannot ever be that lucky. So we also need to improve the road network uh, and the best standard when cyclists are sharing the roadway with other forms of transportation is to have a protected bike lane. Uh, the most simple way to protect a bike lane is to take the parked cars, move them off the curb by about 10 feet and put a bike lane in along the curb. Those parked cars act as a physical barrier, uh, not just in terms of the, the demonstrable safety, but in terms of the level of stress that people feel riding a bike. I can't tell you how many times I have ridden a bike with my son in a bike lane. And, and most of the time, our bike lane rides are unpleasant rides where you are, you're next to parked cars on one side, so you're constantly vigilant about doors opening. And on the other side, there is traffic. And he's seven years old and he cannot swerve more than four feet in either direction without me yelling at him. We turn off onto a quiet side street. We can, he rides next to me, we can ride side by side. I'm, the, I'm his safety buffer. Right. But if we had a protected uh, bike network, you wouldn't see him getting stressed out. And I can see the reaction in his body when a big truck goes by. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden he starts speeding up and I'm like, slow down, it's fine, just stay. And it's, it's hard to convince him that he's okay because really we're not okay. Right. It's not safe. It's the best that that road currently has, but that to us that's not an acceptable answer to what our transportation network should look like. Right. So ideally you have very low stress roads that are low volume uh, where <laughs> They're interrupted for car uh, throughput uh, periodically so that cyclists can get through them, but cars have to turn off. It's like the bicycle boulevard style right. design that those connect to either trails directly or they connect to these protected bike lanes that are physically protected either by cars or by hard infrastructure, not just plastic posts and that right. kind of thing. Um, and then getting people to trails and having that be the, the transportation. I can imagine like when you're riding with your son and, and you know, we constantly see this um, and, and again I, I think it comes back to the, the what we do to to um, evaluate the um, 
the curb space is when you're riding down a bike lane and there is somebody parked in the bike lane. Mm-hmm. Now, it's, it's unfortunate because we, again, we're, we deal with the parking side, but we also know that deliveries are our thing of life. And when that delivery truck mm-hmm. or, or a service vehicle is parked in the bike lane, it really puts everybody into jeopardy at that point. It does, and this is why we've tried, and we have actually succeeded in passing legislation in Philadelphia to make it easier to get loading zones put in. So if your uh, business is on a bike lane, you can get a loading zone for free. Then usually the permit process is $250, and I think there's a yearly fee for it. All of that is waived if your loading zone or your prospective loading zone would be where a bike lane is. So that gives that vehicle a dedicated place to be able to get out of everyone else's way. That UPS truck, that Lyft driver, the Uber driver, the FedEx truck, and all the other you know, um, delivery things that are happening downtown and happening um, where they block bike lanes. Um, so that's one issue is they, sh- they need some, we can't just exclude them and say, figure it out. And they, you know, UPS truck can't park two blocks away with a, you know, dolly full of packages. Right. They'll, they'll, they'll waste tons of time. So they need to be able to park. But we also need to have bike infrastructure that can't just be parked in. Uh, what I've heard a lot of people saying and what I believe is if it's paint, it's parking. Uh, you can't rely on enforcement to keep a, a, right. a vehicle lane open. It's just not sustainable. You can do these enforcement blitzes, but they never are sustained. You need to have a bike lane that someone that a vehicle cannot get into and cannot cross. And that combined with giving those transportation companies, giving the freight companies somewhere to be, can actually just make our transportation network work so much better. So I know that a couple, about a month and a half ago, um, folks in Kennett had an incident with the driver. Mm, yes. And, um, you know, it's, it's, un, it's unfortunate on, on multiple levels. And, and so Bob Dredge, who is the uh, uh, Chester County uh, Bike Coalition, Bike Chester County mm-hmm. uh, president, um, he and I kind of co-wrote um, a, a, an article that we hopefully, we're going to get published, it didn't, but we, we pushed it up on LinkedIn. Um, we talked about, you know, everybody has a responsibility to the road. So, mm-hmm. you know, pedestrians have responsibility to the road. Um, cyclists have responsibilities to the road and that um, vehicular traffic has responsibility to the road. And most people don't understand that, you know, a pedestrian in the state of Pennsylvania doesn't have the right of way just to step off the curb and traffic is going to park for that, pedest- for that pedestrian. Mm-hmm. That mom was always correct. She should always look both ways to make sure it was safe before you cross the road. And, and once they're in that crosswalk, then they, they do have the right of way to, to, to transverse the whole crosswalk. And drivers must, you know, wait until that person is from curb to curb in that. Um, and that's a part of the responsibilities. And then with cycling, we, you know, we, we, there always is that great area, but with cyclists is, is that, you know, we have a responsibility to, um, to ride correctly, um, to obey the traffic signals and, and the laws. Um, but then also for the vehicle or traffic to understand that cyclists have the protection of the four foot law. And so that they're protected, and then on the on the driver side is you know all of those things are in place to make sure that drivers are stayed safe, and they have the responsibility as the as the larger vehicle, the more dominant vehicle on the road, that we do have, and we're all drivers that mm-hmm. we do have you know a responsibility to make sure that we're protecting, you know the other folks, the cyclists and the uh, and the pedestrian. We unfortunately in society in general we don't give ourselves enough time when we're traveling from point A to B. We always seem to be that we're late or the meeting's coming up or we have three different things we don't dedicate ourselves to. <coughs> some of the things, you know, what are some of the advocacy things that um, the Bicycle Coalition helps people understand with that? So we have um, a Bike Nice, Drive Nice campaign where we remind folks what their rights are and also what their responsibilities are. And I think uh, it's, it's easy for everyone to know their rights. Um, but it's a little bit different talking about responsibility uh, and your responsibility to other people besides yourself. Uh, and so that applies, to, that, all, that applies to people who are riding their bikes. They need to be responsible to, to ride safely and not put more vulnerable users like pedestrians in danger by going through crosswalks uh, when they don't have the light uh, and also by endangering uh, automobile drivers by swerving in front of them and that kind of thing. But by far, as you were saying, the number one responsibility on drivers 
their vehicle is orders of magnitude more dangerous and more deadly than any other vehicle on the road. It's the most dangerous thing we do every day. And we accept that 40,000 people a year die because of the way that we get around as just a cost of mobility. And that really needs to change. And drivers need to be made to see that they're responsible for what, ha for what their car does. You know, there's all these articles that talk about the, you know, the car out of control car. Well, that's not a controlled driver. The driver should have controlled their vehicle. Um, that there are all this media coverage that seems to blame the victim. There was a, a child killed on a sidewalk in Brooklyn, New York, uh, and the police said, well, he didn't see the car coming because he was on his phone. He was on the sidewalk. He shouldn't have to be vigilant for right. cars flying onto the sidewalk. That shouldn't even have been part of the story. But it was still, how can we find a way to, to absolve the driver of the responsibility right. for this two-ton vehicle? Uh, so we're trying to we're trying to sort of change that that conversation to make everybody realize that they have responsibility to keep each other safe. So if somebody wanted to find more about that campaign, where would they find that information? You would find that at bicyclecoalition.org. Um, I don't want to give the exact location right now because we're changing mm -hmm. our website. So I don't want to send people to a page that will soon no longer exist. Right. This information is going to be uh, relatively easy to find under our campaigns tab. So Lennon, thank you for taking time out um, mm -hmm. to spend with me here after the uh, the breakfast. Um, if somebody wants to know more about the, the Bicycle Coalition or wants to bring you into one of their municipal meetings or community meetings, um, how can they reach you? So there are three ways to reach me. Um, you can reach me at my email address. It's Leonard, L-E-O-N-A-R-D, at BicycleCoalition.org. You can go to our website as well. Uh, the website has a, a contact us uh, field at the bottom and you can say, I need to get in touch with about this specific issue. It'll be rooted to the appropriate staff member. And also we have a Twitter page. It's called BCGP Suburbs, so at BCGP Suburbs. Uh, and that's another way that folks can reach out to us about, about specific interests or concerns they have. Great, thanks Linda for being with us today. Thank you very much, Tim, for having me.